Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Cleveland Clinic CEO and President, Dr. Tom Mihaljevich. Good evening. Uh, Larry Merlo is President and Chief Executive Officer of CVS Health, widely considered to be one of the top healthcare companies in the world. Since uh, 1963, CVS has grown from a retail health and beauty store to an integrated provider of pharmacy, benefit services, minute clinics, and health insurance. Today, our guest, Larry Merlot, leads a team of 265,000 colleagues. So if you think that Cleveland Clinic is big with 66,000, I ask you to reconsider. When, with 10,000 retail locations and customers in 49 states, Puerto Rico, and Brazil. Uh, Larry Merlo grew not so far from here in a small town in Western Pennsylvania, and his father worked in a Corning Glass factory. In 1990, Larry joined CVS and advanced to, through uh, the role of a CEO and president in, in 2011. Under his leadership, the company has undergone a dramatic evolution, and many of us have uh, watched it with amazement. In 2014, he announced that its stores would no longer sell tobacco products. He also announced that the uh, company will have a new name, CVS Health. And in 2019, CVS Health completed the purchase of Aetna Insurance, a deal that uh, New York Times called the big deal that has the potential to reshape the nation's healthcare industry. Larry's visionary leadership has brought CVS Health into millions of lives, and we'll find out today exactly how many millions. He's challenging the status quo to make healthcare more simple, local, and affordable, and to help more people to achieve their best health. Here is a video about CVS Health, the company that uh, Larry leads. Life is a beautiful journey. Everyone has their own path and their own pace. Our job is to help them get there. And today, the way forward has never looked brighter. Because today, CVS Health has assembled all the elements to not only help those we serve get well, but help them stay well in body, mind, and spirit. Together, we're bringing expert care to local communities, to front doors, into homes, and hands, creating welcoming moments, millions of times each day, more affordable, accessible, simple, and seamless. We are healthcare innovators, delivering health with heart, firm in our belief that when we put people first, we move health forward. It's a new day in healthcare, and tomorrow we'll go farther still. Because life is a beautiful journey, and no matter where you want to go, we'll be with you all the way. Please join me in welcoming Larry Merla. Please have a seat. So, for our audience, uh, this is going to be a great conversation because I think we're going to address every single issue in healthcare with, okay. with solutions as well. I'm I hope everybody packed a sleeping bag. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much for coming. Uh, it's great to be here. Thanks for having yeah, me. Tom. Thank you, Larry. I think this is a forum when we invite people, uh, not only from our industry, but uh, from different parts of our society, so to say, to share their insights about important topics. And... Uh, this topic about healthcare is a really, really important one. Obviously, we here at the Cleveland Clinic live and breathe it, just like you do in your organization. But before we speak about the healthcare in the United States and, and globally, uh, I would just like to ask you something about your background, because our audience is oftentimes interested about how do people get to the position that, that you have, the position when you are responsible for now all this, <laughs> more than 100,000 uh, uh, colleagues, when you're running such a large organization with a national uh, 
uh, relevance and influence. Tell us a little bit about how it, how it, how it all started. Well, Tom, you mentioned I, I, I grew up not that far from here, so it's kind of like you know, being back home. And, and I remember uh, it was 1997 that CVS had actually acquired the Revco drugstores, and, you know, and I actually you know, got sent to, I actually had an apartment in Stowe for about two years as you know, we assimilated the two companies. And you know, I was telling somebody earlier, um, I, I still am a Stewart fan, but that was, that was right at the time that the Browns moved to Baltimore, which I know was a very dark time. <laughs> but I was very impressed that you know, the Cleveland fans actually adopted the Steelers for just that period of time. <laughs> and then as soon as football came back to Pittsburgh, or back to Cleveland, you know, the Pittsburgh-Cleveland rivalry went right back to where yeah. it had started. So, uh, but no, I, I grew up in, in Western Pennsylvania and, and actually, you know, I was gonna, I had gotten to my junior year in high school and was really thinking about majoring in music. Hmm. And then one day, you know, realized what am I going to do with a degree in music? And I actually had a chemistry teacher because I loved chemistry. And he said, well, you know, if you like chemistry this much, why don't you look at pharmacy? And so that's what got me on the pharmacy path and went to the University of Pittsburgh, had a great experience there and loved, you know, working in a community pharmacy. And I, I really appreciated the role that the pharmacist played, you know, more than 40 years ago in terms of you know, getting to know your customers and, you know, and what the customers you know, look to the pharmacist to do okay, and to help them with. And, you know, and, and, and I tell our pharmacists this all the time, I haven't seen this change in, you know, in 40 years that you, know, you think about the pharmacist as one of the most accessible and trusted professionals. And you know, I, I remember you know, customers telling me things about their health and and I'd say, well, have you talked to your physician about this? And they would oftentimes say, no, should I? And I would say, absolutely. And every now and then, someone would say, would you call them for me? And, you know, and so I learned you know, that I, I think, Tom, you mentioned this earlier, that we talk a lot about making healthcare local. And I think that was my first experience in terms of what that really meant for you know, patients you know, every day around a variety of, you know, ailments, concerns, or just things that they were worried about, about their family. So how, how did you then move from, Kevin, this joy at your work and interacting with uh, customers, with patients, uh, to being a person who is responsible of leading others in, uh, in the same effort? How did that come about? Yeah, you know, I, you know, I had the benefit of, of working for some very talented people that taught me an awful lot about you know the business and and really you know began to get very interested in in the business side of pharmacy and you know and that's where that you know all started and in terms of taking on responsibilities outside of the store environment as you know in in field or what's commonly referred to as store operations and uh, you know and then uh, I, I was fortunate that, you know, every time there seemed to be a special project or something that needed to be done, somebody was tapping me on the shoulder that, you know, how about doing this? And, and one of the things that I learned from that, uh, and again, I tell, you know, our, 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 colleague, our CBS colleagues this all the time, that, you know, I, I think in, in today's day and age, everybody wants to get promoted. Yep. And, and as I sit here today, if I didn't take on those assignments that were, they weren't promotions, they were lateral in nature, but they took me outside of my comfort zone and things that were not core to my education or my experience. And if I didn't have the opportunity to do those things, I don't believe I'd be in the position that I'm in today. So I'm curious about, uh you know, when you take a role from leading a smaller group, now you're leading a group that spans across an entire country, you know, also obviously, you know, in Brazil and other, in other uh, parts, parts of the world. How has your management style uh, evolved? How do you motivate such a large organization in so many different locations, uh, different constituencies, if you will? How do you motivate them to work together, to work as one? Yeah, Tom, another great question. Look, I, 
when I moved into this role, it was 2011. And, and one of the things that, you know, I realized is, you know, all of a sudden, you know, uh, the team that I was a peer to, all of a sudden I was now their boss. So those relationships changed in a, in a pretty material way. And all of a sudden, you know, things that we would, you know, talk about, well, I don't know if I can tell him that now. He's my boss, okay? And, you know, but, you know, one of the things that I remember taking a step back and thinking about, what, what are the things that, you know, that you really believe in? And, you know, and, you know, I came up with my list of 10 things that, you know, I, 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 for me kind of became, you know, my guidepost. And, you know, one of the things, Tom Honor, that I think speaks directly to that question is, you know, I think when, when we get in the roles that we're in, folks think that we have all the answers, and, and we don't. And, you know, there are times when we're teachers, but there are just as many times as we're the student. And the role of communication becomes even more important than ever because, you know, how do we make sure that we're, you know, good listeners? And, you know, and that, you know, we create an environment where, you know, people are, you know, being, you know, honest about, you know, when you ask the question, you know, this dynamic of, well, you know, don't tell me what I want to hear. Tell me what, you know, what's really going on because, you know, if you don't do that, I can't help you. And that's my job as, you know, as a student. And, and I think, you know, creating that alignment across the organization, I think, is what, you know, is what becomes critically important. Can you give us the items from your 10 item list? Well, you know, I, I can. Because everybody, everybody uh, is know, waiting for that. I'll, I'll, tick, I'll, I'll tick the important ones off. Okay, important that? ones. Yeah. Okay, but, you know, don't forget where you came from. Okay, and, you know, I could remember the first time I ever met one of the senior executives, I was scared to death. Okay, and, you know, and at the time, that person didn't make me feel comfortable as well. <laughs> Okay, and you know, so it, it's you know, we we get to see colleagues, and they're and and they're going to make an impression, or they're going to form an impression based on, you know, we may only have a chance to interact with yeah. them one time. Of okay, course. and you know, so how do we make that experience, uh, you know, as productive and you know thoughtful as we can? One of the other things that we talk a lot about is. You know, we've got a great organization. We've got, you know, great colleagues that always work hard to do the right things. And, you know, but we talk a lot about how, you know, when we're working on things, you know, take it, take a deep breath. You know, and there's a tendency to rush in to start if we're trying to fix something or build something. You know, people are charging full steam ahead. And we talk a lot about making sure that we're solving for the right problem. So how do we make sure we're getting to you know, to the root cause, to the right root cause, because, you know, we could be working on the wrong thing pretty quickly. Yeah. Uh, we talk a lot about that. Uh, one of the things that we talk about as a leadership team is, you know, the, the value of, I mentioned communication earlier, but, you know, how do we work as a team? And, you know, we, we have such a diverse business now. You know, we've got, you know, retail pharmacies and a pharmacy benefit management company, and now, you know, an insurance company and, you know, some, you know, equally important but smaller businesses. And as we're sitting around the table as a leadership team, you know, there is no single one of us that can answer every element across the spectrum of, you know, of uh, the care that we provide. So, you know, we talk a lot about communication and, you know, and the benefits of a highly engaged, uh, you know, conversive team. You know, acknowledging that, it's not a democracy here, yeah. okay? And you know, and Tom, you talked about tobacco, okay? Yes. And I'll, I'll, we can get into that later if you want, yeah. okay? But you know, I'll never forget the dialogue that we had as a leadership team. And you know, and you know, I, I think in the role that we're in, once we have had the benefit of getting, you know, the input that we need, then you know, it's decision time. And you know, as the CEO, we can't procrastinate. So. You know, those are, you know, I can keep going, but uh, uh, maybe, maybe I'll stop there. Okay, I got through about half of them. Yeah. Let's, let's, let you know, let's speak about tobacco. You know, the decision that you made is now five years ago? Five years. We celebrated our fifth anniversary yesterday. Yeah. 
How did you come up to that decision? What prompted you to do so? You know, uh, Tom, in 2007, you know, CVS Pharmacy and Caremark, which is a pharmacy benefit management company, came together as one. And that was really the beginning of a journey of being more than just a retail pharmacy. You know, and so that was 2007. Uh, you know, fast forward to 2010, uh, we actually had, at the time, we had a mission and a vision. And you know, one, I, I smile about this because we had the consultants do it. That was mistake number one, okay? And, <laughs> you know, and, if, and by the way, we had the mission and the vision in all of our offices, and you know, I'm being honest when I say this. I had mine strategically positioned that you know, if you were in my office and we were having a conversation, I was able to look out the corner of my eye and trying so that you wouldn't catch me because if someone asked me, first of all, they were long paragraphs, they were words on a piece of paper, and no one knew what they meant. So we were trying to you know, become more of a healthcare company, but no one understood what that, what that was. So we, brought, we bring our top 300 and so leaders together a couple times a year, and in one of those meetings, you know, we put up on the wall, you know, here's, here's uh, the mission and the vision. Tell us which one's which. You got a 50% chance of getting it right. Okay, <laughs> and you know where you know what you know where this is going. That's yeah. exactly what we got. 50% uh, got which one was the mission, which one was the vision. So we put a cross-functional team from individuals across the organization. It was less than 20 people. Uh, we said, here's the charge. And by the way, these 20 really understood what our strategy was as a company. We said, we're gonna blow up the mission vision, no consultants, you guys gotta to come together as a team and tell us what that should be. And I gotta tell you, it took them two weeks, I'll never forget this, because I, I actually had tears in my eye when they came back, because a person came back and said, Larry, we came up with a purpose, and the purpose is eight simple words, helping people on their path to better health. That was it, okay? and. You know, we went out, we road tested it with some of our colleagues, and it resonated like that. People could turn around and say, well, here's what I do. Here's what I do. And then we went and took it out to our stores, did the same thing. Now, you could expect what a pharmacist or a pharmacy technician or a nurse practitioner would say, but I'll never forget one of the cashiers you know, said to me, well, Larry, if I have a senior citizen or an elderly person who's got a couple bags, you know, I'm going to ask them if I can help them take their bags out to the car. So, you know, those words meant something very meaningful to, you know, everybody in the organization. That, you know, so, you know, it began a journey, okay, of, and I, and I, te I tell that story because it is critical, you know, to the tobacco decision. Yeah. So this was now 2011, and, you know, we're trying to do more things. You know, we were expanding Minute Clinics. We were talking to, you know, Cleveland Clinic about how we can work together, you know, as an integrated delivery system. And, you know, and I could remember sitting in, you know, some of those meetings where it would be about two-thirds of the way through the meeting, somebody would bring up, but you guys sell tobacco products, don't you? And our chief medical officer at the time, he was in, you know, many more of those meetings, you know, and Troy Brennan was coming back and saying, Larry, we can't sell tobacco products. And back then, we were selling about $2 billion worth of tobacco products, okay, uh, across 7,600 stores. So, you know, so this was now we were around, you know, we're now into, say, 2013, where, you know, as we were plotting out our growth plan for the next five years, you know, we had to come to grips with the reality that is tobacco going to be an enabler or a barrier to growth? And that was a hard decision because of, in, you know, you see the environment in which, you know, public companies operate today. There's, there is a tremendous amount of short-termism that exists. And, you know, what are you going to do next quarter? What are you going to do this year? And we weren't going to make up $2 billion of revenues in one quarter or one year for that matter. So, you know, we had a lot of discussion. Uh, back to my example, I got everybody's opinion, okay, and, 
you know, and it was decision time, and, you know, and I said, we can't, you know, this is gonna be a barrier to long-term growth. We took it to our board. And, you know, Tom, we were talking earlier, you know, what's the role of a board of directors? And this was a very interesting board meeting, and I, 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 I give our board a tremendous amount of credit because the discussion lasted about a half hour because they understood our strategy, because we had talked about you know, all of that. And our board turned around and said, Larry, you can't sell tobacco, it's the right decision. And I'll never forget one of our board members said, don't be shy about telling the story. So it was in February of 2014 that we announced that you know, we were gonna eliminate tobacco from 7,600 stores. We would do that by October 1st. And we actually were tobacco free on September 3rd, 2014. And you know, as you mentioned earlier, we decided to rebrand the company. Our corporate name was CVS Caremark. We changed our name to CVS Health, you know, reflecting you know, our ongoing strategy to be more of a healthcare company. So this is, this is a really uh, important shift in your strategy and the development of your uh, organization. If you were to go back at the beginning of your career and the industry that you're leading today, how would you, correct or, how would you describe the changes that have happened? Oh, boy. Tom, I, I mean, you know, growing up in the retail pharmacy and, and you know, some of you will remember these days. When, when I first started, I was managing the People's Drug Store. I'd worked for People's Drug in Washington, D.C. Uh, for 12 years, and CVS acquired the People's Chain in 1990. So I was managing our store in the Georgetown section of Washington, D.C., and that store had a soda fountain. So if I was opening the store, I had to get there at 6 in the morning because you had to get the crew in to fire up the grill, and at 7 a.m., you know, we were serving breakfast. And, you know, you can remember those, many can remember those days where the corner drugstore, you know, was the local gathering place, had a soda fountain. And, you know, and then, you know, and, and that, that transition began, you know, in probably in the 70s, and it continued into the 80s with fast food, you know, uh, operators kind of taking business away from the soda fountains. And all of a sudden, you know, the drug stores became more convenience stores uh, and offering a little bit of everything. And Tom, I could remember in, you know, strategy sessions back in the 90s, you know, having this discussion, you know, as CVS Pharmacy, were we a convenience store that happened to have a pharmacy in the back of the store or were we a pharmacy that had a convenience offering? Now, that sounds like a very subtle difference, but you know, those, the answer to those two questions are a world apart. And, you know, when, you know, and we really didn't come to grips with that question for probably another 10 years. You know, when, you know, back in 2007 is when we really answered that question by saying, you know, we're a pharmacy that has a convenience offering as we look to expand our role in healthcare. You know, and, and, and as I think about our strategy today, we're looking at the corner drugstores being more of a health destination that you know, continues to have, I'll call it a front store offering of health, beauty, personal care, and some elements of convenience, okay, but it's not gonna be the convenience store that you know, people have come to know for the last 20 years. Yeah. Another, another really uh, probably interesting point and in perspective for our audience might be in debunking of some of the um, myths about the business of pharmacy and PBMs. There's their perception and their, their realities. Can you name the two or three most common misperceptions about the pharmacies and PBMs? and then what the reality looks like. Yep, great, that's a great question. And you know, one of the things that uh, I think is really an untapped resource, and it's, uh, I will say, you know, the role of pharmacy, that you know, there's nothing that's more aggravating to a pharmacist if, than you know, somebody says, you know, all you have to do is put the pills in a bottle, okay? And, you know, and you, you Today, when I was in pharmacy school, it was a five-year program. Now it's a six-year program. You know, you're a doctor of pharmacy, and 
you know, one of the opportunities that we have broadly across healthcare is, you know, the ability for pharmacists to practice to the top of their license. And, you know, the, uh, the laws that govern the practice of pharmacy are largely regulated at a state level. And, you know, the, the, the laws at the state level haven't kept up with the, the opportunities that, you know, exist for pharmacists to play a broader role. And, you know, you look at, we, we talked about tobacco as, as one example, the role that pharmacists can play you know, in promoting cessation and the fact that, you know, tobacco illness is well over $200 billion of unnecessary, you know, health care costs today. You talk about something like medication adherence. Yeah. Uh, the statistics here are very alarming that, you know, someone who is newly diagnosed, some chronic disease, um, by the time they get through their first year, you know, more than 70% are not taking their medications as prescribed. You know, and, you know, a lot of it is, you know, you think about, you know, high cholesterol and it's largely asymptomatic, okay? And, you know, as we look at adherence rates, you know, across, you know, hypertension, high cholesterol, diabetes, you see it every day. So there's so much more, you know, that pharmacists can do in that regard. And, you know, and look, I, on, on the PBM side, I would say as an industry, we've probably uh, created some of that with the black box, mm -hmm. you know, mindset that is out there. And I think as, uh, as a company and as an industry, there, uh, there is, it, we are bringing more transparency, uh, you know, to that, uh, to that process. But look, we, we have a, you know, we've got a, I'll say a, a bit of a tug of war, if you will, between the PBM industry and the pharma industry these days, okay? And it all centers around the cost of medications. Right. And, you know, uh, there is, there are huge opportunities there. You know, you look today at, you know, about almost 90% of all the prescriptions that are dispensed across the country are now generics. Uh, that's not where we hear about the cost of medications. You know, it's, you know, today specialty pharmacy is, you know, less than 10% of prescriptions, well under 10%, but yet it's approaching 50% of pharmacy costs. Right. And that's where we need to do more. When it comes to determining the cost of medication, and obviously for us on our side, we're looking at a cost that continues to grow four to five, six percent per year. Uh, what can large organizations like yours do in order to tackle that particular problem. I know that there is there also there are a lot of perception or misperception uh, about a topic who actually determines the ultimate cost cost of drugs. I'm sure you must be asked about this particular issue many, many, many times. So could you just clarify this for us? How does it actually work? Well, Tom, what PBMs have done a lot of good things around uh, the use of formularies uh, to drive down costs. and. You know, it, it's, you know, it's easy when, you know, the drug, the branded drug loses its patent protection and, and you now have a generic that, you know, can be interchanged, um, you know, in a very simplified way. Uh, it, it becomes, you know, much more complex, okay, when the generic is, you know, is not available. And I think as, as an industry over the last several years, we have seen new product launches from pharma you know, in, across therapeutic classes where, you know, as you look at incremental effectiveness over the existing therapies, there really isn't anything more that that product is doing than the existing therapies, and the products are being introduced to the market at inflated price points. So, you know, as an employer, you know, you sit here and say, well, why should we be paying more for you know, a product that is not going to improve the outcome for, you know, for my employees. And that's where formularies have, have come into use where, you know, there is a preferred branded product uh, and, you know, what PBMs have been able to do is, you know, negotiate a discount for placement in the formulary and, you know, and that has dramatically reduced the net cost, you know, of pharmaceuticals. Uh, and, you know, those rebate dollars by and large go back to the plan sponsor. Uh, 
I think one of the challenges, Tom, that we do have as new products are coming to market largely in you know, the biologic you know, space, I think we're all becoming increasingly concerned with the launch price of those products. And you know, we've got, and, and we are working on you know, new and different, uh, I'll say outcome uh, you know, reimbursement models where you know, you've, you've now got products, you look at the autoimmune therapeutic class where you know, you've got products are, that are approved for three, four, or five different indications. They may be 90% effective for indication A, 50% effective for indication B. We shouldn't be paying the same price okay, for those two products, recognizing the effectiveness is going to determine the health you know, of, of the patient that we're serving. So those are things that we're working on. And I do think that you know, it is, uh, we're going to end up challenging the, I'll say, the current regulatory environment. Because I, I can see one of the dynamics that are going to get in the way is you've got you know, best pricing as it relates to government-sponsored care. And I think one of the things that we've got to figure out is I know pharma is going to push back on you know, an outcomes-based reimbursement that is going to force them to lower the price across the board you know, when you look at you know, Medicare or Medicaid yeah. uh, recipients. And we've got to figure out that if the drug doesn't produce the desired effect for that particular patient, how pharma isn't penalized across the broader book of business for that. Yeah. So it gets pretty complicated. Pretty quickly. Pretty quickly, but those are things that you know, we have begun to work on. Yeah. So let's just speak about something that has been obvious in the public eye for quite some time, Syria Setna. How did it come about? How does it really add up to your aspiration to improve the, the health of a large, a large number of people here in, here in the United States? Well, Tom, some of it goes back to some of the things I mentioned, whether it's, you know, the, the role of the corner drugstore, the role of the pharmacist, uh, you know, the role that the PBM plays. And, you know, CBS Health and, and Aetna have had a relationship that goes back to, you know, 2011. At that time, Aetna had made a decision to outsource uh, their, the, the management of their pharmacy component to Caremark. And I could remember, you know, for, you know, a handful of years now, you know, talking to you know Aetna CEO uh, Mark Bertolini and Mark, there's tremendous things that we can do that will help you know create a better outcome for an Aetna member. And the challenge wa for 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 CBS was every time we would execute one of those you know events, if you will. We would incur the cost of that, or the cost of building out that infrastructure, and the benefit would accrue to Aetna as the insurer. Okay, and if we could avoid a visit to the an, an unintended medical event, and you know, we could never figure out an economic model, okay, that made sense. And you know, and by the way, Tom, that's really what started to drive, you know, as. We, as, as we at CVS thought about our strategy for, you know, the next decade, you know, the role that the insurer now plays in, you know, in this broader company. Any challenges with integration, or has it been all easy? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know the answer to that. Okay. <laughs> Listen, I don't just, think just ask. I, I don't think you know integrating two companies is you know is ever easy. There's you know a tremendous uh, amount of work and activities. But I, I will say, you know, we're eight, nine months into it and, you know, very pleased with how it's going. Um, you know, the, interesting, for the reason that I mentioned, the, the two companies actually knew each other quite well. So, you know, we understood where our cultures were similar, where they might have been different. And we've gotten a tremendous amount done in a short period of time. We have, you know, our, I'll call them our laboratory stores where... Uh, you know, we're calling them health hubs, where you would you will see a different CVS pharmacy than you know what you would see you know here in Cleveland. Uh, we we've taken about 20 percent of uh, the store and we've repurposed it to health related services. Uh, so we have an expanded minute clinic, if you will. We have you know a, a, a nutritionist. Uh, a respiratory therapist that you know is on. We have a well uh, a wellness room where 
Uh, I w happen to be, th these stores are in the Houston market, and you know, I happened to be there one day and, and uh, you know, in the wellness room, uh, you know, they were doing chair yoga with a group of senior citizens. Uh, so the response that we've seen from, from the customers, and it's been a short period of time, but you know, it's validating the belief uh, that we've had about the need to make healthcare local and meet people where they are you know, in their community. So let's just speak about a really tangible uh, improvements in, uh, you call it a customer, we would call it a patient experience in a, as a result of, uh, of the acquisition or the, the merger. Well, Tom, one of the things that, that we're seeing, I know one of the questions that we often get that, you know, as we talk about somebody, sometimes someone will say, Larry, it, it sounds to me like you're trying to replace the role of the physician. And, you know, and, it, and it's interesting, I, I was sharing this with Tom earlier that you know, I was in Los Angeles giving a, a, a talk to the, the uh, economic club, and there was a Q&A. Someone on this side of the room said, Larry, I'm listening to what you said, and I worry about what you're doing that compromises the physician-patient relationship. No sooner did I, I couldn't even answer the question. Somebody jumped up and said, well, before you answer that, I want to talk about consumerism in healthcare. And... You know, and I'm thinking, oh, this is, I, I'm, I don't want to start a war here, okay? But, <laughs> you know, but if you think about it, you know, when we're in the physician's office or, heaven forbid, in the hospital, you know, we are a patient in the hands of a very skilled and trusted professional. But think about, you know, all of the activities and events that lead up to that. Think about, you know, what follows that. You know, today, we have become consumers of healthcare. And there's so much that is, you know, it's up to, you know, to that patient slash consumer to, you know, take the patient with diabetes. You know, they're probably visiting their physician on a quarterly basis. They leave the office with a care plan. That care plan is going to have, you know, diet, nutrition, you know, exercise, medication. But this is where, you know, we see an opportunity to be a complement to the role of the physician because, you know, the physician doesn't know what's, tra what's happening in between those visits until there is an unintended medical event that requires intervention. So we can play that complementary role to ensure that that care plan is being followed. You know, and we can follow that patient longitudinally. And if, by the way, things are getting off track, we can get them back to the physician or we can refer them on to. You know, one of the things that's interesting about Minna Clinic, we've now seen we've now had more than 45 million patient visits. And the numbers that I'm gonna share with you have not changed for the last five years. 50% of the patients that we see do not have a primary care physician. 50% of the visits that we see are nights and weekends. And, you know, and Tom, maybe just one more anecdotal story. So let's go back to Houston. Uh, the, you know, the, the last visit that I made in the nurse practitioner said, Larry, I wish you were here an hour ago. We actually had a patient come in, and she was you know, complaining of abdominal discomfort. Uh, she was a diagnosed patient with diabetes who had not been back to her physician for more than 18 months. So did an, an, an A1C you know, test. Uh, the A1C level was over 12. So more than 2x, okay? <laughs> Called her physician, okay? And long story short, you know, she was within weeks, you know, of, you know, some medical event that, you know, could have resulted in, you know, in a stroke. In a I mean, you know, you, you guys know the consequences there. Yeah. So, you know, you, you think about, okay, we avoided, you know, that, emergency room visit that probably, in her particular case, would have resulted in hospitalization for some period of time. And, you know, hopefully, you know, something that, I actually had a cousin who, you know, it, it, telling the story reminds me of that, that she was a, 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 a diabetic. She was very irregular in terms of taking her insulin, following her diet. And she ended up with, a, you know, one day her blood glucose level shot to over 600. You know, she ended up with a stroke and ultimately blindness. So, you know, and you think about, 
you know, quality of life, you know, her life changed at that time, you know, and, and at the same time, you know, the annual medical expenses that she incurred, yes. okay, was, you can't reverse it at that point. So we sit here today and we say, how many times does that happen that you know, we, can, we can be an important part of that solution? Yeah. So let's just speak about similar yet even much more dramatic opportunity to, to intervene, and that is the opioid crisis uh, in the United States. It yeah. is claiming, claiming more and more lives a year after year with a tremendous impact. Uh, on, on our country and society as a whole, what should we do differently? Well, Tom, maybe I'd just chat for a minute about some of the things that we've done, some of the things that we've learned, okay? And and because you're right, it, it is a crisis and it doesn't discriminate. I think when when all this started, people thought it was in the inner cities across the country, and it's you know it, it, it's in the suburbs, it's in rural America, and and uh, you know it, you often talk about you know the you know, social determinants of health, you know, <clears throat> this certainly falls, you know, into that. Look, one of the things that we started doing, I'm going to say four years ago, is, you know, empty out your medicine cabinet. And we started doing drug take-back programs all across the country. Uh, we worked with local uh, police municipalities in terms of, you know, putting drug take-back boxes there and then, you know, ultimately putting them in, in many of our stores. So, you know, between police department stores where we have about, you know, tw between 2,500 and 3,000, you know, places where you can, you know, safely dispose unused medications and we will properly dispose of it so that it's environmentally friendly. Uh, to date, we've taken back over a million pounds of unused medication. A million pounds. That's just us. And I know, you know, as an industry, you know, many others have joined you know, with similar programs. So, you know, it, 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 when you start seeing that, and to be clear, this is not all opioids, but when you see that, it's, it, it starts, okay, we can empty every medicine cabinet in America, and, you know, back to the things that I believe in, how do we get to the root cause? And, you know, one of the things we quickly realized is, you know, why do we have people leaving the dentist's office, you know, after a tooth extraction with a prescription for 30, you know, hydrocodone or oxy or, yeah. you know, someone, joint replacement or, you know, an ankle sprain that, you know, they're leaving the physician's office or the emergency room with, you know, quantities well in excess of, you know, of what's, of what's required for treatment and, you know, acknowledging that, you know, these unused quantities are getting into the wrong hands. So this would have been two years ago, actually, th this September, you know, we embarked on a program that, you know, if you're a first-time opioid user, you know, we're going to work with your physician to ensure that we're not dispensing more than a seven-day quantity. And, you know, over the past year, the number of prescriptions that we have dispensed for more than seven-day supplies have decreased by 78%. So, you know, I, I would say that, you know, that's, you know, that's a good start. Uh, you know, we've got, we actually have uh, about 30,000 pharmacists that are on our payroll in, you know, 10,000 communities across the country. So today, you know, 75% of the U.S. population actually lives within three miles of a CVS. So our pharmacists have gone out into the communities, uh, you know, into schools, educating students on the dangers of prescription drug abuse. And, you know, we're up to about 600,000 students where, you know, we've been able to engage, you know, in those conversations. Uh, Tom, if you, if you turn around and say, what more do we need to do? Okay, because, you know, obviously the work is, is far from done. I, I think, you know, we've got to continue the education. Uh, you know, we've got to bend the curve in terms of, you know, just the, in, the indiscriminate prescribing and use of, you know, of, you know, of opioids. I know the pharma industry is, you know, continuing the journey of can we find a non-addictive, you know, pain treatment. Uh, you know, I don't think we should wait for that. Uh, you know, and look, there are things that, you know, we need, we also need to do. Uh, we've got, I could remember as a practicing pharmacist, 
you know, the term corresponding responsibility. And, you know, if a, if a physician had his or her prescription blank stolen, then the office manager was calling the pharmacy saying, look, be on the lookout, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And, you know, as a pharmacist, you, you know, could, you, you had a, a sense of, you know, where someone took the three on the prescription and tried to make it a nine, yeah. okay? And you knew what to do. And, you know, in today, it's gotten a lot more complicated than that, okay? That, you know, you got pharmacists that are on the front line that are trying to determine that is this prescription, which, you know, now is a legal prescription written by a licensed prescriber, is it being, is, is it written for a legitimate medical purpose? And, you know, we've invested in technology and analytics to help our pharmacists separate fact from fiction there. And look, we have, uh, you know, we have stopped filling prescriptions for about 500 physicians across the country. Yeah, the, the question was what, what we're doing internationally. And, you know, we have, uh, you know, I'm going to say this might have been seven years ago. We had, uh, you know, our closest international would have been Puerto Rico, okay, which, you know, there, you know there's a different language there, but it's not, you know, it, it, it's not international as we, you know, as we would think about international. And, and we, uh, we acquired a, a small chain in Brazil, it was about 40 stores, uh, you know, a, uh, a, a retail, uh, you know, pharmacy. And we knew what we didn't know, and then we knew that there was going to be another list of things that we didn't know we didn't know, okay? And, you know, uh, we had made a decision after we got into that that uh, as a strategy for our company, you know, trying to open uh, drugstores globally was not where we wanted to go, okay? And, you know, as we looked at the globe, yeah, there was there were some additional opportunities in Brazil, uh, but you know, beyond that, we didn't see opportunities uh, in Europe or, you know, or in even in Asia for that matter. Um, so as we sit here today, Aetna had uh, has a an international business. Uh, it is in about 15 countries. It's headquartered out of the UK. Uh, it it largely provides care for expats. Uh, and that's something that, you know, we're spending time, you know, better understanding the opportunities that we have there for growth. So we have a question from the audience. Hi, hi Larry. Um, Bob Sopko. Uh, we met in 1997 when you bought Refco. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, you guys were very, very kind and considerate. It was, uh, I'm sure, an interesting transition on your side of the equation. Um, and congratulations, uh, Judge Leon approved it today. So now that um, uh, you've integrated part of Aetna, now you can legally do it. So uh, what do you think of the Amazon threat um, that keeps looming in very, very um, different verticals out there, you know, especially your vertical? Yeah, Bob, thanks, uh, thanks for the question. And look, uh, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, Give Amazon credit for what they've done. They've 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 changed, you know, the uh, you know the face of retailing, if you will. Okay, and you know they've done terrific things on the technology side as well. And you know, is, my my answer is going to go back to one of those things that we believe in again. That you know that we spend a lot of time, you know, talking to our customers. And one of the things that you know I know I've learned, and and you know. I'll say learn the hard way, okay, that, you know, uh, you really have to be a good listener because a customer, our customers aren't going to be able to tell us, you know, what to do, but they'll tell us what they're frustrated with. And that's the listening part where, you know, it, be, it then becomes our job to meet the unmet need that they're frustrated with or that they're looking for. So, look, as we sit here today, what can we control? It's another thing that, you know, we talk a lot about. We, we need to control the things that are within our four walls and not get, you know, preoccupied or overwhelmed by things that we can't control. So, you know, if Amazon wants to get into healthcare, wants to get into pharmacy, they're going to do that. Okay. What we want to do is make sure we don't leave any white space for them to disrupt. So it kind of gets back to if we're listening to those to our customers, then. 
you know, it'll be another competitor in the market, and they'll be a good competitor, and you know, and we'll be a good competitor for them as well. Okay, and you know, so you know, some of the things that you've seen us do the last couple of years, you know, we now do home delivery, and you know, you sit here and think about the convenience of pharmacy that, you know. From a bricks and mortar point of view, we're pretty convenient for reasons I mentioned earlier. We have mail order pharmacy. Many more of our stores have drive through pharmacies that you don't have to get out of the car if you don't want to. And now we're delivering to your office and to your home. The, the other thing that we're doing that uh, it's called CarePass, and we tested it uh, last year in three markets. So this is our answer to Amazon Prime. It's a subscription service. And in the three markets that we tested it in, customers love it. And we announced uh, last month that we were going to be rolling it out across the country uh, between now and January. So that's, that's how we're thinking about it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We have another question from the Thank other you. microphone. Good evening. Uh, welcome back to Cleveland. Thank you. Uh, I do want to say that we're marketing consultants, uh, but we totally agree with your characterization of the advice you received. <laughs> about your mission and vision. But um, we were just talking about organizations' decisions to uh, play their part in smoking cessation and talking about uh, CVS's decision about no longer carrying tobacco and even earlier talking about the Cleveland Clinic's decision about uh, tobacco use among employees. Uh, that was probably easier to do, it's more politically digestible, but pardon the pun, the elephant in the room is the obesity epidemic, I mm -hmm. believe. Uh, so where will organizations like yours, retail pharmacies, and uh, like yours, CVS and others, how will you address this big problem now? Are, what are the, some of the things in the works, uh, if you can share, and what's your, your position? Uh, on addressing the obesity yeah. epidemic. No, it, it, a, another great question. And what, one of the things that we had, as you know, as we were making that decision, we had reached out to a variety of, you know, healthcare providers. Okay, because you're right. You know, we sell, you know, soda and, and you know candy and snacks and you know and in some states alcohol. Um, you know, and you know the healthcare professional said, look. You know, there's no amount of tobacco use that can be considered safe. That, you know, the, the, the other items that we're talking about, taken in moderation. And when, after we made the decision, again, we went back out now talking to our customers. And they said the, something very similar with one addition. They said, help educate me on healthier alternatives. So you've seen us do a number of things in terms of introducing, you know, snack lines that have you know, no trans fat or reduced sodium content. And, you know, working with consumer packaged good uh, companies like Pepsi and, you know, so th there is a, uh, I would say that there is more of, certainly for the reason that you mentioned, more, you know, of an industry focus in bringing healthier alternatives, uh, you know, to, you know, the decision making process and at the same time, you know, educating individuals about those healthier choices. I do think in this new company of CVS and Aetna, there's even more that we can do. And you know, one of the things you know, and and that Dr. Cosgrove was was a part of. We were, and I, I I'm going to say this was uh, this was about 18 months ago that you know he and I were part of a small group of individuals that were brought together uh, to address the the question of. How do we tackle the growing incidence of chronic disease in the country? And this was going to be a full day session. And we were one hour into the session quickly realizing that, you know what, for us to address chronic disease, we got to address the social determinants of health, of which access to, you know, healthy food, okay, becomes an important part of that. And so I think now in this new company that there are things that we're beginning to do you know, to address, you know, social determinants and acknowledging that, you know, in, in many cases, we, you know, we can have this debate that, but I, th I do think it's, it's, it's more true than not that your zip code is just as important as your genetic code, okay, when you look at, when you look at health and, you know, and, you know, healthy 
you know, eating and, you know, is going to be an important component of that. Thank you very much. We have time for one more question. We'll take it from the other microphone, please. Good evening. I'm Marjorie Moyer, psychologist, and I'm very concerned with women's health issues. I'm part of a group that is promoting uh, the development of a breast cancer vaccine. So we're talking to women of all ages about the importance in the meantime of mammograms because we have such greater success with early discovery. And so my question is, has um, CVS thought about providing mammograms, either on-site or mobile ones, that have come up in some parts of the country, but I don't believe around Cleveland? Yeah, it, it, we have started to talk about that, and, and we have done, we, we have uh, some partnerships where, you know, we've done the, the, the mobile health bands, uh, you know, in working with others. One of the things that we're thinking about, and, and, and this goes, um, you know, it goes beyond, you know, just ensuring that, you know, uh, you're having mammogram at the appropriate you know, times in one's life. You, we, can, we can expand that dialogue to, you know, what are the other, you know, health preventive interventions that need to occur, you know, on those regular basis. And, you know, again, in this new company, the, the opportunities that we have, you know, to ensure that, you know, we're not missing those opportunities. Because much like you, we see the statistics that, you know, we got less than 40% of, you know, Americans that are, are getting those diagnostic tests at the appropriate interval. So that's something that you will see us, uh, that you will see us working on. Well, Larry, thank you very, very much for your visit. Thank you. thank you for your leadership and good luck. Thank, thank you. you. Really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So while we while we thank in Larry uh, Larry Merlo for his visit, I would just like to announce our next speaker is David Rubenstein. Uh, he's a co-founder and co-executive chairman of the Carlisle Group, and he will be with us on November 25th. Thank you very much for coming.